you for joining us <clears throat> for our online service. Uh, it's good to, well, it's not good to see you because I can't see you, but maybe it's good for you to see me. Welcome anyway. I've just been reading uh, books of Ezra and Nehemiah and I was impressed by the efforts of God's people uh, to to rebuild things. They'd been in exile and they were coming back from exile into a very different situation, something that was maybe smaller and and not as nice as they'd had before. But nevertheless, God had moved uh, miraculously for them to bring them back from what looked like a hopeless situation in Babylon and where they were thrown out of their land. Uh, and he brought them back uh, through the efforts of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, amazing and, and interesting to me how how their efforts and their what they did with their hands married with their faith uh, and what they were doing in serving the Lord. Uh, and God can do that for us. Uh, we are in some ways not different from them. Uh, we are emerging from what COVID uh, has done to us into a, maybe a more difficult situation uh, than we'd known before with, with new challenges. Uh, but we have a little faith in God uh, and we can add our efforts to it. Uh, and I'm encouraged by that. Let me pray for us uh, as we start our service. Father, we thank you that we can be in your presence. Uh, we thank you for those who have gone on before and have been an example to us for their effort and their faith. Uh, and we pray uh, that their example may inspire us. Uh, and that's something that we would hear in the course of uh, this service just now would do just the same, uh, that you would use it to make us better, we pray. Amen. forward to this. You can see, well I'll show you again, I've got porridge with fruit, it's my favourite. Strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, banana and some blackberries. Mmm, mmm, that tastes so good. Oh this is lovely. 
If only I could explain to you how good it is. Mmm, that was a raspberry. Oh, so delicious. But it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to explain how things taste. How they taste to me might not be how they taste to you. But there's a verse in the Bible that I want to tell, talk to you about, about taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, I've finished my breakfast now and it tasted really good. And this is the verse that I just mentioned to you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And it can be found in the Bible in the book of Psalms, number 34, and this is verse 8 within it. And it was that first line that I wanted to talk to you about. Taste and see that the Lord is good. There's something very personal, isn't there, about taste. We can hear something and we'll probably all hear it pretty much the same. We can see something and we can see, everybody can see it. But when you taste something, then it's very difficult to know if what you're tasting is the same as what someone else is tasting. Because taste is very personal. And I think that's what David was meaning when he wrote this psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to taste for yourself. You can't rely on someone else's taste. You have to taste for yourself. So I could tell you that the Lord is good, but until you actually find that out for yourself in your own life, then you won't really know. So what God has done for us is he's given us his word, which is the Bible. And we have God's word that we can turn to and read any time we want to show us how good God is. Now, when I think about that, God's word is what created the whole universe. It created the stars, the heavens, the galaxies, all of that. It tells us in Genesis was created just by God's word. And yet we have our Bibles, which is God's word. So we have this at our fingertips. All we have to do is to taste it ourselves. Now, you might think, well, I've been a Christian for a long while. I know the Lord is good. But sometimes it just helps us to remember, to taste afresh, to maybe go back and read some more of God's word. Maybe we've stopped reading it as much as we used to. Or maybe we've just been busy. Or maybe we're back at school after half term and we haven't got time anymore. Well, if we read God's word, it helps us and reminds us just how good God is. And we can see in our own lives then, because we taste for ourselves, how good God is. So here's a reminder of that verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then it says, blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. It's like a refuge, it's like a safe place where we can go. And it's because we can always trust God. Even when things happen which we might think are disasters or they're not good for us, we can always trust him if we've put our life in his hands. But to do that, we have to taste and see that the Lord is good for ourselves. Thank you for listening. Um, hello, my name is Janet Killing, and uh, before coming to Christ, my life wasn't great. It was a lot of depression. I was like very sad and everything wasn't good for my life. I reached a stage in my life when my back was against the wall and there was no way out. 
the only way out was to come to the Lord Jesus because I tried every door and it wasn't working out. It was just not working out. And it was only one way out. And that was only by coming to God. When I finally made a decision to give my life to God because I was praying, I was doing everything because I just wanted him to fix that problem that I was going through. Which I, I, my, my heart was broken. I was, my life was a mess. And I just wanted him to just um, fix the problem and then I would be like back at where I was again. But I didn't understand because I didn't really know God. I heard about him, but I didn't really know him. And in order for him to fix the problem, I had to surrender 100% to him. But although I was seeking God, I was doing everything. I was feeling this assurance and I was feeling like, you know, I knew that God, God was going to help me, but I didn't know that there was only one way for him to help me unless there was a total surrender. It was until I surrendered my life to God because praying and praying, I was getting nowhere. In order for him to enter my life and change the situation, I had to do a total surrender. And when I decided to surrender my life to God, that was when he came in instantly. The broken heart went, the depression went, the anxiety attack, everything just went. I had to like do a double take and touch my body and see if something, if this was a miracle. I heard about miracle, but the first thing, the first time I've ever actually experienced one, there was a sudden joy and a sudden assurance it was like there was a strength that came through my body i didn't know where it came from there was just boldness there was this assurance it was everything and from them i started to walk and tell everybody that they should give their life to god because there was this boldness in, inside me. i didn't know where it came from but there it took away everything because i was totally broken and from that i never looked back i keep on going because i know that god was god is with me and it's been from 2008 until now, it was the 15th of July, 2008, when I got my encounter with God, and until now, I'm still walking with the Lord. That's my testimony. After I surrendered my life to God, as I was saying, I was telling everybody to come to Christ, because Christ is the only way, there is no other way. He is the only way, as the Bible says, the truth and the light. Nobody coming to the Father but by Jesus Christ. And I was telling everybody, testifying, and I told my son, at the time he was only 17, and he decided to go to the church. And from he decided to go to the church, I keep praying for him, encouraging him every day until he turns to me and said to me, I'm gonna give my life to God and I want to do, to do the work of God. And then at the time, because he was underage, I had to like give like consent for him to go into ministry. And from ever since, he's been doing the ministry from 2009 until now, and he's doing his ministry around the Caribbean and saving souls for God. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in
John chapter 2 verse 12 to 25 and it reads then Jesus went to the town of Capernaum his mother and brothers and his followers went with him they all stayed there a few days it was almost time for the Jewish Passover so Jesus went to Jerusalem there in the temple area he saw men selling cattle sheep and doves he saw others sitting at tables, exchanging and trading people's money. Jesus made a whip with some of the pieces of rope. Then he forced all these men and the sheep and cattle to leave the temple area. He turned over the tables of the money traders and scattered their money. Then he said to those, to those who were selling pigeons, take those things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place for buying and selling. When this had when this happened, his followers remembered what was written in the scriptures. My strong devotion to your temple will destroy me. Some Jews said to Jesus, show us a miracle as a sign from God. Prove that you have the right to do these things. Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will build it again in three days. They answered, people worked 46 years to build this temple. Do you really believe you can build it again in three days? But the temple Jesus meant was his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his followers remembered that he had said this. So they believed the scriptures and they believed the words of Jesus said. Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Many people believed in him because they saw the miraculous signs he did. But Jesus did not trust them because he knew how all people think. He did not need to, to he did not need anyone to tell him what a person was like. He already knew. Amen. Well, hello and welcome to our 141st online Sunday meeting for the 6th of November 2022. No commitment from Jesus is the rather unusual, perhaps somebody feels intuitively wrong title, but it's true, taken from John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25, part of our reading earlier in the service. Now, when he, that is, it, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many 
believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all people and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He didn't need anyone to tell him what was in them, what, what, what made them tick, what was their motivation. He knew. So, what is the meaning of that phrase? Jesus did not commit himself to them. To whom does it apply that he didn't commit himself? Who were they? And why didn't he? They're the three points I want to look at. What is the meaning of that word commit? Jesus didn't commit himself to them. Well, it's the same word translated believe in the verse before, in verse 23, when he was at Jerusalem in the Passover, many believed in his name. The word believe, it means trust. And, and trust is, if you really trust someone as to who they say they are and so on, and you believed in Jesus as the saviour, you would commit yourself to him as the saviour and so on. If, if you believe in a cause, you're not going to commit yourself to it unless you have that firm commitment or, or rather understanding and belief that it's true. And then following that, you commit yourself. Well, um, here's an example in Luke chapter 16, verse 11, a uh, parable that the Lord Jesus told. Um, I'm not going to explain the parable, but I'll read it. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, Jesus was referring to money there, who will commit to your trust the true riches, the true spiritual riches? Um, if you can't be faithful in, in ordinary money, the true, the spiritual, eternal riches of God, who will commit them to you, give them to you to use and so on. That's the, that's the thought of committing. Now, uh, earlier in this Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is described as the word who became flesh. The word, the speech of God, that the mind of God expressed, who became flesh, who became one of us, who became a man, the only begotten Son of God, so that we could see him, appreciate him, as it were, grab hold of him, comprehend him, but both by experience and by our understanding. That's the idea, or as Paul puts it, God was manifest, seen in the flesh. This is the one who commits himself to us. Now, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2 verse 9 says this, in him, that is again in the Lord Jesus, dwells all the fullness of God bodily, all the purpose of of God Almighty is contained within this one person, a man. Whether that was exactly true while he was on earth or not, I don't know. By that I mean, by the time Paul is speaking here, Jesus had died on the cross, risen from the dead, ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. In other words, he can do things now that he couldn't actually do on earth. That's why I say that. But in him dwells all the fullness, everything that God is and wants for us is in him. So all the love of God. God is love and he, he demonstrated that most clearly. But by his son dying, God becoming a man, dying for our sins. That's the constant love of God, the justice of God. There can be no deviation from that which is absolutely right and fair. And Jesus, by taking all the sins of the world, means that God can deal justly with sinners like us and justify us, acquit us. This is what the Bible teaches. All the wisdom of God is in him. God, who knows everything, created everything and is able to use every circumstance and time, all that is good and bad, the demons, the angels, men, millions of, of people, circumstances, earthquakes, just everything to, to bring about his purpose because he is all wise. This, this, this is, and all that wisdom is in 
The fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Christ. All the power of God directed to save a person, to make a person malleable and like God, like Christ, the disciple of Christ. All that power is in Christ. All the holiness of God, that is, all the attributes I've just spoken of, love, justice, wisdom, power, and more, that is separate from anyone or anything else. He is so far above and wonder, and, and the, 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 those angels in heaven cried, holy, 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 apart, perfect, wonderful. All that perfection, holiness, is in Christ. The fullness of the godly, bodhead, Godhead bodily dwells in him. And this is, this is, he is imparted to us. He commits himself to people, some people, not all. The way Jesus put it, and here's a verse before he, he died, but anticipating the situation that we're in now, and this is how he put it in John chapter 16, verse 15. Here, the Godhead is mentioned, the three members of the, the, the Trinity. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that he, and he's now talking about the Holy Spirit, shall take of mine and will show it to you. You who are disciples who are learning to me. Those of you who have committed yourself, believed on me. This is what life is. This relationship with me based on self-revelation all that i want you to know and i have everything and all that god is contained in that teaching i'm sharing it with you how through the holy spirit i have everything that the father has it's mine and i'm giving it to you through the holy spirit but not to everyone jesus did not commit himself to some people well to whom did he not commit himself Astonishing, really, who, who they are, that they were extremely privileged people. Let me read you verses 23 and 24 again. Now, when he, drew, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. These were the people of God. They were blessed above every nation in heaven. They, they've been chosen as God's vehicles to have blessing and then to be the, 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 the medium, if you like, the, the, the agent of, of blessing all over the world. And this was the capital, the place where God had put his name, Jerusalem, of those people. In it was the temple. The temple was due to be, meant to be a house of prayer of all nations. All nations should come there and find a relationship with God. Uh, it was at the feast of the Passover. Of, this was the central feast. It was what, what was called the beginning of months. They changed their calendar when this, this feast was inaugurated, at least the events that meant, that led up to this feast. When, when a lamb was sacrificed and the, 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 in Egypt and the angel of death passed over, the, in other words, the sin of the people was taken by that lamb. Can't look into the story more than that. This was the reason that they were a nation. And at that Passover feast, and they were seeing and listening to the very one who was the fulfillment of, of what had happened at the Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb who, who was slain for us. The one that all the, 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 the Old Testament part of the Bible pointed to how privileged they were but the point is it's not privilege it, it, it's not just opportunity that that is enough it requires a personal absolute commitment to that truth to that one for the blessing to be there and and because they didn't trust him jesus did not trust himself, commit himself to them. And that is the final uh, point. Why? Why did Jesus not commit himself to them? Because he knew what was in people. There was nothing capricious 
or you know, it had no favoritism. You know, oh, I like you and I don't like you. Nothing, nothing like that. It wasn't like an arbitrary decision. That it was a reason. It was based on his knowledge of people, and it still is based on that knowledge. Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all people, and he didn't need that anyone would testify of man. Nobody needs to tell him, for he knew what was in man, and he knows what is in a man, a woman, a person. Uh, he, he just uh, knows that. They saw the miracles. You see, it says they believed on him in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Well, there was a certain authority which they had to admit was there. This, was, this is amazing. <laughs> That they saw it, they were intellectually convinced, and they believed. But they believed in the miracles, not in the person, not in Jesus himself, not the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, they missed the point that, that the miracles were important, but they were they were in themselves signs that, that he was the one that he claimed he was. That that they'd missed, and, and he knew that. And he could not commit all his blessing and, and, and the revelation, further revelation of who he is to them as a result of that. Now I'm going to give you two examples in conclusion of this. One is in this same Gospel of John, just moving on to chapter 6. I'm going to read you verses 26 and 27. This followed the, the feeding, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. I'm not going to talk about the story. Just do look at John chapter 6. It's well worth looking at. But here's what Jesus said, verses 26 and 27 of John chapter 6. The people had gone after him, they'd found him. Just say that. Jesus answered, answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. So it wasn't in their case, just the miracles. And what that told them about Jesus. It was just the food, free food. They wanted to make him a king, kind of on that basis. Maybe there was a political motivation as well, but it was just the food. And Jesus said, labour not for the food which perishes, but for that food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For him has God the Father sealed. He set him apart, put his, his, his stamp of approval on this per person. So then Jesus went on to explain that that. The, the physical bread, actually he, he was the real spiritual bread of life which you had to eat. Now I won't go into all that was said there that he said, but notice even his disciples found this difficult. But, but Jesus knew. He knew what, what the motivation of these people in the first place, but now even some of his disciples. Uh, he knows what's in them too. Verse 60 to 63. Many, therefore, of his, of his disciples, when they heard this, that he was the bread of life and you had to eat bread uh, and eat him. Well, obviously, he was talking metaphorically, spiritually. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? We don't get this. We, this is just too difficult. When, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained at it, he said to them, does this, does this offend you? What if you shall see the Son of Man, that was Jesus himself, the Son of Man, ascend up to where he was before? What if I'm not even here? You, you only have my spiritual presence through the Holy Spirit. How difficult is that going to be? It's the Spirit that makes alive. The flesh, natural things, profit nothing. The words that I speak to you, they're spirit, they're life, they're spiritual words. This is not, this, you're not getting this. Uh, and even, can I say, one of the inner disciples, one of the 12 called apostles, even one of them didn't like it, wouldn't receive it. But there are some of you that believe not. So he's talking about his disciples in the wider context, not just the 12. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. That was one, Judas. Think of the privilege, the opportunity 
being with Jesus, seeing him and yet missing, not wanting, not receiving what he had. And Jesus could not commit himself, therefore, to him. Well, that was true then. That's an illustration of Jesus not committing himself to them. But I'm going to give you now an illustration of, of, of Philip preaching the gospel in Samaria, which is like the situation we're in now, now that Jesus is in heaven. But the, the same principle applies. So let me read you verses 12 and 13 of Acts chapter 8. But when they believed, Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. This is believed in the sense that they committed themselves to Jesus. They trusted him. As in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him commits themselves, commits themselves to him, trusts him entirely with their welfare and their eternal life and forgiveness of sins and so on, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what happened to these people. However, the same word is used for someone else who wasn't in that category. It says Simon himself believed also when he was, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. These miracles, Jesus was working through the spirit, doing these miracles, confirming the gospel. And, and Simon was a magician. He had great authority and uh, prestige in the community, which he lost when the gospel came. And he had to acknowledge this. And he was, he believed, he could see it. And he was even baptised. But later on, he did something that showed Peter that, that he was completely out of touch with it. Um, he tried to buy the blessing of God. You'll have to read the, the, the story in Acts chapter 8. To, to learn about it. But, but that was like the people that Jesus would not commit himself to. Um, and that's very sad. He had, he had his ulterior motives. He, yes, he kind of wanted the power of Jesus, but to bolster what he wanted. He, he wasn't committing himself to Christ and his ways and purpose. So Christ did not commit himself to him. So in conclusion, in conclusion, Jesus is the final and full revelation of all that God in his love and wisdom and power and perfection and holiness wants for us. And Jesus will communicate that to you. Pardon, pardon for sin, freedom from the power of sin and the guilt of, of sin a new righteousness, ability to do and even think what is right and a joy that, that is eternal, that is the joy of God and heaven in my heart, usefulness and an eternal relationship with God. All this is in Christ and he, it's in him and that Christ will fully commit himself to you all about him and all that he is. And he longs to do that. He's just waiting to do that. If you fully trust and commit yourself to him, you may do that. And you will find that Jesus will, you will not be among those to whom Jesus could not commit himself. He knows what's in you. He knows if you just want, oh, I, I know I'm a sinner, I know there's so much wrong, but I just want you and all that you have. I want that, please. I Give yourself to him. And he will unreservedly give himself and show himself to you. Amen.
praise. Be thou my inheritance, now and always. Be thou and thou only the first in my heart, O Sovereign of heaven.